We uh, thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that your arms are always open wide, that yesterday, today, and tomorrow, they're always open wide, no matter what we've done, no matter what we're struggling with. We can run to you, and uh, we can just approach the throne of grace with confidence. And uh, God, we thank you for that, because we know that when we do, there's miracles, there's breakthroughs, there's healing, and there's change. So, God, we thank you that you are unchanging, and yet you change everything. And for that, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture reading can be found in Luke 13, uh, verses 1 through 9, and in verses 31 to 35. We'll put the verses on the screen for you, and if you do not have a printed Bible, uh, please find a member of our VIP team after the service, and we'll give you a Bible. Verse 1, there were some present at that very time who told Jesus that the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, and he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And this is verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thanks, Casey. Um, we are in a series that we started last week called The Great Reversal. So if you've been with us, uh, we have been started the series last week. If you missed it, you can go back online and catch up and listen there to uh, learn more what the series is about. But basically, in a nutshell, the series is describing one of the missions that Jesus had. In fact, the most important mission that Jesus had, which was to reverse course of everything about this, lo- this world as we know it. That this world as we know it was created, uh, and it was created by God, and it was good, and it was right, and it was perfect, and sin came in and corrupted the world, and as a result, everything was backwards from the way God intended it to be. But here's your problem and my problem. We were born into the world as it is, not as God intended it to be. And therefore, for us to learn how to follow Jesus, we actually have to learn how to live life in reverse from the patterns of this world. We have to learn to turn things around. So Jesus' call to the disciples was one that often went against the grain of everything they thought they knew, everything they thought they understood, everything they thought religion had taught them, everything they thought that their cultural heritage had taught them. They were living constantly in reverse from that. And this was the ministry of Jesus. Not only was it what Jesus taught and the example he gave, uh, but it was also what Jesus did in people's lives. He would restore sight, restore sight to the blind. He, he would reach out to the prostitute and restore her dignity and give her worth and, and give her a better way to live. He, he was constantly reaching out and reversing the 
fortunes and reversing the circumstances and situations of all the people around him. Jesus brought about the great reversal, and he invites us to join him to be a part of that great reversal. But what it requires on our part is it requires us to reverse course. It requires us to to cease going in one direction and to begin following Jesus by turning around and going in a different direction as we follow after him. So this passage that Casey read for you from Luke chapter 13, verse 1 through 9, and then 31 through 35, really talks about this idea. It's maybe not the most encouraging or inspiring passage of Scripture that you're going to read in the Gospel of Luke. I know this morning in the early service, Sherry leaned over to me and said, well, that's a great way to wake up in the morning. You know, towers falling on people and death and destruction. But, but here's what I want you to know. As we go through this passage of Scripture, I want, you to, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about God's invitation to you to reverse course from what you see in this world, the trajectory that this world is on and all the ways it leads to all kinds of pain and suffering and how Jesus is inviting you to live in reverse of that. And so as we look at this, this passage I think tells us three things about a word that we sort of say is a church word, a religious word, but I think it has so much more meaning to us than just religious categories. The word is repentance. Repentance literally means to reverse course, to change direction. And so I think in these verses, what we see is we see the need for repentance, we see the motivation for repentance, and we see the result of repentance. So if you look with me back at this passage, we'll be in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Let's first start by talking about the need for repentance. Now, this is a word that society doesn't understand, and it often rejects this word as simply religious jargon. But I want to share with you, first of all, the definition, Webster's Dictionary definition of repentance, okay? Here's repentance. Repenting or being penitent, feeling of sorrow, especially from wrongdoing, compunction, contrition, remorse. Now, there's nothing inherently religious about that. This is this idea, Webster gives this idea of feeling sorrow, especially for something that you've done wrong, Uh, contrition, remorse. So it's got this sense of, oh, I feel really bad about that. I I feel terrible that that happened. I don't think that's the best definition. I think the best definition comes to us from Erdemann's Bible Dictionary, and this is what it says, and this is the definition I'm going to use today. Here's what it says. Repentance, a complete change of orientation involving a judgment upon the past and a deliberate reflection for the future. Now, what that means, what that definition means, is that there is a complete and total change, a a course reversal. And it has to do with an orientation involving a judgment that made about a former way of living, something in the past, and a deliberate redirection for the future. So this is the way things were, this is how life was, and now this is how life is going to be. I used to be this way, and now I'm going to be this way. You know, I used to, you know, I, I used to root for the Philadelphia Phillies, and now I'm going to root for the Atlanta Braves, okay? I mean, it's a complete reversal of whatever it is you're doing. So, so it could be anything in your life. I used to spend my money this way, and now I'm going to spend it this way. I used to think this way about sex. Now I think this way and act this way. I, I used to think this about relationships that I have. Now I'm thinking this way. It's a total change of behavior. It's a redirection of our actions. I was in a situation a couple of years ago um, in our community where I was asked to be a part of a racial reconciliation task force. Um, it was for a local organization that had gone through some really difficult things and there had been some, um, some issues of racism in the organization that needed to be addressed and some in- inequities. And they invited me to be a part of this task force. And as I sat and listened to a lot of really smart people talk about all the different things and the different ideas about this, I, I learned a lot. Um, But I realized that the the group was asking for an apology. They wanted an apology. It's a reasonable thing to ask for because these things had happened and there needed to be an apology. But as they were talking about the apology, I realized they didn't really want just an apology because an apology isn't really quite enough. They wanted a change of behavior. They wanted a reorientation of the way the organization was operating and thinking. They wanted there to be measurable difference in the organization. But they couldn't come up with anything better than apology. So I'm sitting there thinking, I know the word. I know the word. You're not going to like it, but I know the word. So when the time was right, I just floated the idea. I said, you know what I think you're asking them to do? I said, I think you're asking them to repent. And there was an audible gasp in the room. 
We knew we shouldn't have invited that preacher. But here's the thing. What other word is there to describe what was needed? There is no other word. Because you and I both know that an apology is not enough. An apology doesn't carry with it any commitment to change behavior or thought or actions. An apology just simply says, and this is one of my favorite things, I'm sorry you felt that way, right? (laughs) Talk about a a non-apology. But that's all an apology is. An apology is never more than simply saying, I'm sorry that affected you. I'm sorry that hurt you. I'm sorry that happened. But being sorry for something and actually repenting of something are two very different things. There is no other word for this. There is no other word in the English language that describes what it is that we desire to happen. And it doesn't have to be in religious circles. We're talking about society-wide, big-picture issues, and the only word that can fulfill what people are expecting, whatever side of the political aisle, whatever your religious views, whatever it is, the only thing that will satisfy what people want is repentance. It is ultimately a change of orientation, a change of thinking away from one way to another. It's a change in behavior. This is exactly what Jesus has called us to. I love what Tim Keller said about repentance. Because, see, an apology is easy. Some of you have apologized. And it might have been hard. You had to swallow your pride. But it wasn't as hard as when you had to change. Like, change was hard. It's one thing to tell your you know, significant other, tell your kids, tell your boss, oh, I'm sorry. It's another thing to actually do the hard work of making the change. I love what Tim Keller says about this. He says, No action requires more human greatness nor produces more human greatness than repentance. It requires human greatness because if you're going to repent, it is going to cost you something. But it also creates human greatness because as you go through the process of repenting and changing the direction of your life, God does an incredible work inside of you that's transformative, not just for you, but potentially for the people around you. And this was at the heart of Jesus' mission. Listen to what he said in Luke chapter 5, verse 32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is at the heart of what Jesus is saying. I have called people to live life in reverse. I am calling people to reverse course on the way they live. And notice what he says. I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. Now, it's an interesting thing Jesus is doing here. Because Jesus is saying, if you were righteous, you wouldn't need repentance. If you had it all together, there would be no need for you to reverse course. So therefore, if you assume that you are righteous, you don't need to change anything. Anybody in the room perfect today? Anybody? Nobody. Because here's the thing. What is Jesus saying? You don't need me if you think you're already righteous. You don't need me if you have it all together. But I have called, come to call sinners to repentance, to reverse course. He got this cousin, John the Baptist, as John was preaching down by the Jordan River, as he's calling people into the baptismal waters, said this, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now that's an interesting phrase. John is saying bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So the question is, well, what is the fruit of repentance? What, what does repentance look like? And you may not have put these words on it, but I know you've thought about this. I know at some point, whether it was in a marriage relationship, whether it was a situation with a boss, you at some point have thought to yourself, what would it take to make this right? Well, she would have to do A, B, C. He would have to do this. If if they're going to make it right, it's not just an apology. This is what they're going to have to do. Let, Let me share some of these words with you and see if this helps us understand what repentance is required, what is required of us in repentance, and what we're looking for other people when they repent. First of all, fruit, fruit in keeping with repentance. First is responsibility. We must take responsibility for our sin. Now that's another church word we don't like. But Let me just change the word and see if you like this better. We must take responsibility for our mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a mistake is something you make on a math test. Uh, A mistake is like I didn't mean to do that. I I I bumped into the you know I I I scraped your car. I didn't mean to. I didn't plan to scrape your car with my bumper as I'm pulling out of the. That's a that's a mistake. That's an accident. But what we're talking about is something more than that. We're talking about stuff we choose to do on purpose. I did that on purpose. I think that way on purpose. I believe that on purpose. And so what we're talking about is something more than a mistake. And we have to ultimately take responsibility for our sin. And the second thing we have to do is we have to regret. We must sincerely regret our sinful behavior. Not just that I'm sorry it made you feel that way. That's not good enough. 
But we have to ultimately feel sorry. We ultimately have to feel the regret that comes with our behavior. Not just the regret that it caused this other person pain, but ultimately the regret that we feel because of the pain we know that it causes God. That he, all those people that you have harmed throughout the course of your life, are his children made in his image whom he loves so dearly that he would send his only son to die for. So any sin that we commit against another person is ultimately and foremost a sin that we commit against God. And we have to take responsibility and we have to regret it. Now those two, as hard as they sound, they're the easy part. That's the easy part. By, by, by taking responsibility and regretting, that's the easy part. The next two are the hard part and they take time. We have to resolve. We must determine to stop our sinful behavior. And this is difficult. This takes work. Because depending on what that sinful behavior is, it may not just be like turning off a spigot. It may be something that you have to get therapy for. It may have to be something that you actually have to work at. You may have to change a course of behavior or a course of thinking that has been with you and maybe has even been in your family for generations. This takes work. Our friends in recovery call it the 12-step. These are, these are all parts of the 12-step. Why, why does that align so closely? Because the 12 steps come from the gospel. That ultimately, we not only take responsibility, we not only regret, but we make a resolve. We resolve in our minds and our hearts that we are going to change the way that we are behaving. And here, listen to me. This is why repentance isn't done in a moment. And I'm saying this for two reasons. One, because some of you who are right now living with somebody who you hope to be repentant, and you need to understand that repentance takes time. And you have to give people time to repent. You have to give people time to change the way they think, to change the way they behave. And it's not going to happen overnight. And yes, they may take a step back. But ultimately, your decision to accept an apology, that's instantaneous. But if you're going to walk with somebody through repentance, you need to be prepared for that to be a long, hard journey for them and for you. And I'm saying that for you, if you are right now in the middle of your life and you're living in repentance, and I hope we all are, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But if you're living a life in repentance in reverse, it's a process for you. It's something that's going to take time for you to change your thinking, change your behavior. It's going to take time to reorient your life around a new pattern of living. So we resolve to change the way we live. And finally, we repair. We must do what we can to repair the damage our sinful behavior has caused. This, our, our friends in recovery call this making amends. And it can take a lifetime to do. It can be hard. And there's only so much you can do. There are some things you can't undo. Right, you can't have your first marriage back. You can't bring your kid's childhood back. You can't do that. But what can you do? What is within your power in order to repair the damage? See, when we talk about repentance, we're talking about something so much bigger than an apology. And an apology will never suffice to bring about the change that we all know our world needs. This is why Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, here's a question. Do you know that you're a sinner? Because if you don't know that you're a sinner, then you fall in the righteous category, meaning that you think you've got it all together. But here's what we know by God's grace. We are all sinners. And God has justified us by his grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we all recognize that on a daily basis, we need to live our life in reverse to, in order to follow Jesus in the course where he's leading us. So this passage that, um, that was read for us earlier is an interesting story. Um, Jesus is talking to some disciples, and some people come up to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, what about those people who were killed in the temple? Because there were some Galileans who were, um, they were rebelling against Pontius Pilate in a tax he was issuing. And so they had rebelled, and Pontius Pilate was going to teach them a lesson. So he sent his soldiers into the temple as these Galileans were making their sacrifice. And as they're in there making their sacrifice, these soldiers come in, and they're just supposed to beat the Galileans. But instead of just beating them, they actually kill some. And so the blood of these Galileans is mingling with the blood of the sacrifice that they've offered. And so these people are asking a legitimate question. They're coming to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, what about those people? Like, tell me about them. It would be sort of like the question that maybe we would ask today when, when, you, when you see different things going on in the world, a, a tragedy, a natural disaster, war like it's going on in Ukraine, and you would go to Jesus, because we would all do this, Jesus, what about those people? 
Like, and here's the question, isn't it? Like, what did they do wrong? Now, come on. Like, because if you're a good God and you're a loving God and you're just, then that doesn't seem right that that suffering would be going on if you're still a good, loving, just God. So Jesus, what about those people that were killed in the temple? That's the question. Well, Jesus one-ups them. He's like, oh yeah, you think that's bad. What about those guys who got killed down there when the tower fell on them? Like you could blame Pontius Pilate on the first, but that's just a tower that fell down. What about that? And they're like, oh, that's even worse. Like what? Okay, Jesus, what's up with this? What? Were they bad sinners? Did they do something to, to, to offend God? Were they not living righteous lives and that's why, the Herod, that's why Pontius Pilate killed them? They weren't living righteous lives and that's why the tower fell on them? And see, here's the reverse thought in that, okay? Here, if we think this way, here's the reverse thought. Well, towers aren't falling on me, so I must be okay. You know, the police aren't coming into my church and taking me off. I must be doing all right. You know, there's not a, Canada's not invading America, so we must be doing good, right? I, I mean, here's my point. There is this comparison that we inherently have inside of our minds when we start thinking about this idea of, of human suffering and the fact that we're not suffering. Something inside of us tries to justify this because we think somehow if God is good and loving and righteous and just, only good things happen to good people and only bad things happen to bad people. Here's the problem. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. If you read the book of Job, what do you read? You read the story of a man who was a righteous man. God called him righteous. And yet he lost all of his children, all of his wealth, his health. He lost everything. And he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus' disciples are walking uh, one day and they pass a man who is blind, blind from birth. And they say, Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. You guys don't get it. You don't understand. This guy's blindness is ultimately going to be, bring glory to God. It's going to bring glory to the Father. And then Jesus healed him. It had nothing to do with the man's sin. It didn't mean he was less righteous than Peter or James or John. And if you continue on through the story, you start asking questions. Okay, If John the Baptist... John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, Jesus said there was nobody born of woman better than John the Baptist, and yet John the Baptist was arrested by Herod and beheaded. Meanwhile, Peter denied Jesus three times and lived. Was John the Baptist a worse sinner than Peter? Or was Peter a worse sinner than John the Baptist? Well, what about this? What about the fact that Stephen and James, the two earliest disciples who were martyred for their faith, that they were arrested and ultimately executed. Meanwhile, Peter and Silas, an angel comes and delivers them out of prison, and they get away. They escape. Were Stephen and, were Stephen and James worse sinners than Peter and Silas? You see, this is the problem we have. When you look at the world and you see the, wor the way the world wor works, you look at what's going on in different parts of our world, the suffering, the pain, the, the, the death, the anguish, the unfairness, the injustice of it. And we say to ourselves, where is God in the middle of that? What we need to do is look in the mirror and say, for whatever reason, there but for the grace of God go I. It is out of, it is out of the realization that unless we repent. See, Jesus said to these guys, you see that tower that fell on them? You see those people who died in the temple? I tell you, unless you repent, you will end up just like them. Here's the truth, okay? Big reveal, you ready? Unless Jesus comes back, you're all gonna die. Okay, I mean, right? Unless Jesus comes back, you're all gonna die. Now, it may not be as dramatic as a tower falling on your head. It may not be as dramatic as the invasion of an army into your place of worship. But the ultimate truth is what Jesus is saying is, guys, at the end of the day, the sun rises on the just and the unjust. God causes the rain to fall on the evil and, and the righteous alike. This is the world in which we live. Every single one of us are called to live in repentance, to live in reverse. What does he say? He says it twice in Luke 13, 3 and 5. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, we tend to infer from superior circumstances, superior character. Because I've got money in the bank, because I'm healthy, 
because I'm secure in my country, because I'm secure in my faith, because my church is secure. We somehow think, and it's, it's insidious. You don't consciously think this, but what happens is somewhere inside your mind, the enemy begins to say, yeah, you're doing good. You're just fine. Because if you weren't fine, surely these good things wouldn't be happening to you. You must be righteous. You don't need to repent. And what does Jesus say? No. No, unless you repent, a tower is going to fall on your head too. Because death is coming and we all have to live in reversal. Don't compare. When bad things happen to other people, we don't look at them and compare. We look at them and we repent. We look at them and we repent. And this leads us to the motivation for repentance. And and I think it's said best for us in Romans 2, 4. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. God's kindness to you is meant to lead you to repentance. When you woke up this morning and you weren't holed up in your home because the military had invaded your country, God's kindness to you in that moment should lead you to repentance. When you woke up and you knew where your children were, God's kindness leads you to repentance. When you woke up today and you're not battling cancer and your loved ones aren't battling cancer, God's kindness leads you to repentance. And when you wake up and the diagnosis is cancer and when you don't know where your kids are and when the army invades, guess what? God's kindness still leads to repentance. This is what God has called us to, to live life in reverse. It is not based on our circumstances, be they good or be they bad. God's kindness. Tim Keller said, Uh, repentance is the conviction of two realities. The first one is that you can't repent unless you realize that you deserve to have a tower fall on your head. Unless you realize that you deserve to have a tower fall on you, you can't repent. Because as long as you believe that you deserve the good things that are happening, then there's no reason for you to ever repent of your behavior because your behavior is producing the goodness you're experiencing in life. You see how that works? If my, if my behavior, if my circumstances are good and my behavior is producing those good circumstances, why would I ever repent of that? Instead of seeing it as just God's kindness to you. See, here's a question that we all wrestle with. And, and you don't, whether you're not a Jesus follower at all, whether you've been following him your whole life, at some point in your life you've asked this question, why do good things happen to bad people? Why? Why do good things happen to bad people? Well, there's a couple of assumptions in that question. The first assumption is that there are good people. I mean, come on, let's be honest. What is the definition of a good person? How good does somebody have to be in order for them not to suffer any of the consequences of living in a fallen world? How good do you have to be? Do you have to be as good as Job? Well, clearly you have to be better than Job. Do you have to be as good as John the Baptist? Nope, you have to be better than John the Baptist. What about Jesus? Do you have to be as good as Jesus? They crucified him, right? I mean, here's the point. Here's the point. Unless we come to grips with the fact that we all deserve, except for the grace of God, any, anything bad that happens, we will never live with true appreciation of God's blessings and grace in our lives. It's by his grace that we live. It's by his grace that we understand these things. God doesn't owe you a good life. I know that that doesn't feel like a very warm and fuzzy message on a Sunday morning. But when you come to grips with the fact that God doesn't owe you health and wealth and well-being and happiness and satisfaction, when you come to grips with that, here's here's what happens. You suddenly become grateful. You suddenly are filled with gratitude. Because I don't deserve these things, and yet God has chosen to give them to me. And when the bad things happen, guess what? I probably deserve worse than that. And God is not leveraging that out based on my good or my bad behavior. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I live with the consequences of a fallen, broken world. And so, yes, there are times the rain falls. And there are times the armies invade. And there are times the diagnosis is cancer. And there are times the spouse leaves. And there are times the bank account is empty. But by the grace of God, he continues to call you out from that brokenness into wholeness as we live a life in reverse, as we live a life of repentance. The first thing is you, have, you will not repent unless you realize what you deserve. And the second thing is you must believe that God is committed to saving you 
from what you deserve. That God is committed to rescuing you. And he's not just trying to rescue you from an uncomfortable circumstance. He wants to rescue you from ultimate and final destruction. Look what happened in, in verses 6 through 9. There's this, gar- there's this tree planted in a vineyard. And um, in Israel, really the only fertile ground were in vineyards. They used the fertile ground for vineyards. So if somebody wanted to produce a tree that would bear fruit, they would plant it in a vineyard. So this tree is taking up valuable space in a vineyard. The owner of the field expects the tree to produce fruit. After three years, the time when a fig tree is expected to produce fruit, when it hasn't, he tells his gardener, go cut the tree down. Why? Because it's taking up valuable soil. It's taking up valuable space. Take it out. And what does the gardener say? He says, no, let me tend it. Give it another chance. Here's the truth. When you were still a sinner, that was what Jesus did for you. That Jesus, when your life was not bearing any fruit, Jesus said, let me have an opportunity. Let me tend, let me care for, let me nurture. So that when we were unproductive, when we were sinners, Christ died for our sins. Jesus, as the gardener, came to rescue and save us. And then what do you see in verse 31 through 39? Jesus, as he heads to Jerusalem, the Pharisees warn him that Herod is trying to kill him. The gardener is heading in to take care. He's heading in to fertilize the soil with his blood that we might come to find life and bear fruit in him. And we hear Jesus plea to the city of Jerusalem. As he looks over the city, what does he say? How long have I longed to gather you under my wings like hens gather her chicks, but you were not willing. Catch the image of this. This is one of those feminine images in the Bible that Luke is using, that a hen would gather her chicks under her wings and protect them. So some of you may know we have two dogs. One is the young dog named Benny. Um, not too long ago, I was walking with Benny, and he, we were in a park, and he was off the leash, and he saw some geese, and he tore off after the geese, and the geese flew away, and they flew over a creek. There was a steep, and Benny thought he could jump the creek, and down he went into the creek, and then we had to fish him out and all that. And I thought he learned a valuable lesson, you know. So a couple days ago, my family doesn't know this part yet. A couple days ago, I'm walking Benny in the park again without the leash, and Benny decides there's, a, there's two geese and there's some goslings, a little herd of goslings following after the geese. And Benny says, oh, we're gonna, this is going to be fun. I'm going to chase them again. Only they had babies with them. Guess what Mama Goose did? Yes, exactly. She turned around. See, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, just like a mother hen, I long to gather you and protect you. I would even sacrifice my life to save you. But what does he say? But you were unwilling. You were unwilling. You were unwilling to live a life in reverse and bearing with repentance. See, both the tree and the chicks could have been saved if they had been spared. They could have been spared if they would have responded to Jesus. The tree, if it responded to the nurturing and care of the gardener, it would have been saved. The chicks, if they had gathered under the wings of Jesus, they would have been saved. I think there's no way to know this is true, but I, I, I think that Jesus, when he, was, when he was thinking about this and looking over Jerusalem, he had a psalm in his mind, Psalm 91. We're going to get there in just a minute. But, but this leads us really to the result of repentance, the result of repentance. See, there's something about hens that are pretty fantastic. If a chicken coop catches on fire, a mother hen will actually bring her chicks under her wing and she will die to save her chicks underneath her wings. This is exactly what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He has been willing to spread his wings and to gather all who would come in repentance to be saved from the coming destruction. See, tragedy will come to one and all, but those who take refuge under the wings of Jesus will be saved. Listen to what Psalm 91 says. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Do you trust God today? Do you recognize the dangers of the fallen world in which we live? And are you willing to come and take refuge in his shadow? 
He goes on and the psalmist says, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge." Towers fall on everybody. There is nobody who should not recognize the fear of an invading army, an injustice. It comes to all. The question is, are we willing to repent and live under the shelter of God's wings? 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, For godly grief, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. See, this is if you if you heard this message today and you live here thinking that man that it's just like all Baptist preachers, nothing but shame and regret. Repentance is not shame and regret. Repentance is actually liberation from shame and regret. And anybody who preaches something different than that is not preaching the message of the gospel. Repentance leads to no regret. Repentance leads to no shame. Because Christ himself has covered you from shame and guilt with his wings, whereas worldly grief produces death. See, worldly grief is asking for an apology when what you really need is repentance. Worldly grief is saying, I'm sorry, when really what you need to do is reverse course. So here's my challenge for you today. It doesn't matter. You say, I'm, I'm, I've repented of my sins. I'm good. You're probably the one who's not good. Because Jesus did not call you to one-time repentance. He called you to live a life of repentance. When the good happens, you repent. When the bad happens, you repent. When you deserve it, you repent. When you don't deserve it, you repent. You live your whole life in repentance. And if you are here today and you've never followed Jesus, this message is for you as well. Seek to live a constant state of reversal. Seek to live in a constant, perpetual state of reversal or repentance. When the good things happen, when the bad things happen, repent. See God's grace in the good. See God's grace in the bad. And here's a little test for you. If you think, well, I, I, I think I do that. I'm living in, I'm, I live in, I, I'm in repentance. I'm grateful when the good things happen. Uh, you know, and I, I'm grateful when the bad things happen too. I'm giving thanks in all things. But let me give you a little test, all right? When something good happens to you, or when the last good thing happened to you, did you say or did you think it's about time? It's about time. It's about time I got the raise. It's about time I got the promotion. It's about time, whatever. When something good happened, did you think it's about time? Because here's the thing. If you did, you rob God of the glory that he is pouring his goodness on you, not because you deserve it, but because he is just good. You, you, and you live in a state of satisfaction rather than a state of gratitude. Let God's kindness lead you to repentance today and every day. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads, and as you do, um, we're going to sing one final song, and we're going to do something we don't always do in this service, but we're going to do it today, and that is just just extend uh, an invitation for you. Um, maybe for some of you who have never repented at all and you would like to reverse course and follow Jesus, today would be a day, a great day. But the rest of us who say we've done that, but maybe we've been satisfied to just continue to live in the flow of the world and not reverse course. Maybe today would just be an opportunity to accept Jesus' call to live in repentance. Father God, we come to you today and we are grateful for your love and your grace, your kindness that leads us to repentance. Father, it's a call to freedom and a call to protection. 
Lord, it's not a guarantee that bad things won't happen, but it is the promise that through the bad, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you have called your own to gather under the shelter of your wings. And Lord, just as Jesus extends his arms on the cross, Lord, may we gather within the shadow of his wings and find safety, find fulfillment. Lord, I pray today that those who are not living in reverse would hear you plea over them as you plead over Jerusalem. How many times have you longed to gather them in their pain and in their joy, and yet they were not willing. Lord, may today be the day that we willingly come in repentance under the wings of Jesus who saves. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.